Our final presentation is Graham Arvidsson. He's Chief Executive of Australian Vanadium um, and he's looking for Vanadium in Australia, funnily enough. Please welcome Graham. Uh, thanks, Chris. We've found Vanadium in Australia, to, to state it more accurately. Um, uh, thanks to the Mining News uh, Select team for organizing the conference. Uh, great privilege to be here. Um, I'd also uh, like to take a moment to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Wajak people of Noongar Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners on the land where we operate, which is near Mikathera, the Yagan Yanaya people. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and extend my gratitude that they take the time to help us understand how to operate sustainably and partner well with them into the future. Um, I'd like to do two key things today. Um, I'd like to convince the audience that vanadium is a really interesting commodity, just like uranium we heard. It's a really important ingredient in the decarbonization thematic that we're part of. And I'd like to explain why I think that's really exciting. And right now there are significant uh, tailwinds in our sales, uh, helping us move forward in the market. Uh, and I'd like to hopefully get across why Australian Vanadium is a great investment because we're developing a tier one asset. What does that mean? We have a 25 year mine life, we have scale. We are strategically positioned in the Midwest of Western Australia with the ability to scale with the industry as it grows and we will be a low cost, lowest quartile producer at less than $5 a pound vanadium pentoxide. And for those not familiar with the industry, that is uh, definitively a world leading um, uh, operating cost. And we, are, I guess, can rest easy knowing that we can uh, wear any economic winds and pers um, persevere in, in any economic scenario. And hopefully as this battery thematic rolls out, we can participate in all the upside the industry has to offer. Um, please, in your own time, read the usual disclaimers. So I've touched on most uh, points with our project and what's recently been happening. Um, we've been moving from a world-class bankable feasibility study that we finished just over a year ago towards uh, getting all the finance, offtake, and project de-risking we need, which ultimately underpins uh, what we call a pit-to-battery strategy. Why do we do that? Because we do have a world-class asset and that it makes a lot of economic sense to do this in Australia uh, to support, in a base case, the steel industry, which is a market that grows at 2 to 3% per year every year for, this, for several decades. But in the upside case, where the, the project can do very, very well, is a vertically integrated story providing vanadium, high-grade, high-quality vanadium into batteries. Um, so what's the story of the vanadium market is decades of steel industry story. 90% of the market has been going into steel for eons. Um, we now, since 2019, have moved from that position where less than 1% of this mature vanadium flow battery technology units of vanadium have gone into it uh, to where we stand today, over 10% of the market in the span of two or three years has now gone into batteries. And we expect by the end of this year, 15%. And that's a pretty remarkable journey that the market's on. As someone who's come from a lithium background, we do like to draw parallels to the, the market, say, seven or eight years ago, where the demand curve was thought about but not perhaps believed in. And the consensus, don't just uh, believe me, please do your research and ask others, is that at least half the market by the end of the decade will be going into flow batteries. So it's a pretty remarkable um, step change in the dynamics of the industry where it was previously just steel linked. So why flow batteries and why now? These bit batteries have been around a long time. There are many multiple generations of technological advancement to the point where they're just proven, fully commercialized, robust technology. Now they have the, the economic and the technical merit in what's happening. So countries like Australia and others are grappling with very large requirements for long duration storage. That's four, six, eight, and 12 hour storage. At about four hours is the crossover point where these batteries start to really uh, win their territory on economics. And then on a technical basis, they're very recyclable. They will last 20 years. Leading manufacturers will literally warranty these batteries with less than 1% degradation over 20 years. So you have this really robust workhorse of the renewable space 
that's really getting uptake. And, and most of that uptake right now, interestingly, is in China, where they're not only building very large flow batteries, installing and commissioning, they are building the manufacturing base that supports it and, and basically underpins their intention to continue on that journey and put very large batteries in to meet their needs. Similar stories are starting to play out on a, on a slower scale in California, and Australia is really well poised to do this. There are definitely industry players who understand the benefits of this technology economically and technically, and I look forward to participating with them in that story in the future. Uh, just quickly, this is the supply curve I mentioned. We are a sub-$5 uh, OPEX producer underpinned by our bankable feasibility study. You'll see towards the right-hand side of the curve, it's quite steep after the current market size. So players like us that can enter the space in that lowest quartile, even in the current steel thematic, stand to do well in the current cost curve structure. Um, the other supply uh, piece that we need to keep in mind and is really important giving us tailwinds is 60% of the world's supply comes from China, another 15% comes from Russia, and a further 10% or so comes from South Africa. So there's a really strong need for critical metals, battery metals, and even the steel industry that we diversify the supply chain. Where better to do that than in Western Australia where we have a billion tons of Jork resource VTM style deposits. So where, where we're operating, uh, just outside Mikathera is our mine. We will, uh, in a simple open cut uh, process, mine magnetite ore. We'll concentrate it using magnetic separation. We'll then haul that concentrate to the coast. Why do we do that? Proximal to very commercial gas. We are right on a rail line uh, less than 80 kilometers from the port of Geraldton. And this enables us to create a scalable model have commercial gas and be able to export an iron ore byproduct, which is a really interesting upside opportunity for our project. Um, just to put it in perspective, this is the billion tons of Jork resources in, in the area. We think uh, with firstly earning our right to exist in the industry through a stage one development, if the demand curve is what we think it is, uh, there's an, a necessity for additional downstream processing and what we call hub concept processing in this area. So we look to be the first mover, be the next, world's next primary vanadium producer and offer that optionality, hopefully, for future growth as well. Um, headlines from our BFS, again, from just over a year ago. We intend to produce 11,200 tons for those who want a metric. That's about 4 or 5% of the current market. So substantial producer, but not enough to flood the supply chain. Uh, 435 million US capex is what we are seeking to fund as we speak, and I'll walk you through our funding status. And a C1 OPEX of 443 is really underpinning what our asset's all about and a 25-year mine life. The, the story of our asset, why is it economic, is ultimately this is a very consistent ore body across many kilometers where we just chase a high-grade seam of magnetite. And this is the hallmark of a good deposit and why we can literally over 25 years have a very consistent head grade and concentrate grade, and therefore underpin the capital and justify building that downstream processing plant. On the financing side, we need debt and equity. We are focused on, on the debt side in terms of well-advanced discussion with government bodies, working through the independent technical expert due diligence processes and, and market lender uh, independent experts as well. We continue to push along those avenues and look forward to updating the market as we crystallize the best debt options that we can get hold of, including other export finance opportunities. On the equity side, we were so pleased and very grateful to announce that we received a $49 million government grant in June, of which we received the first payment. And if we continue to really put that um, grant to work on upfront early works in the developing the asset, we do intend to uh, continue to get those payments coming through as we progress. So it's a wonderful uh, way we can de-risk the equ equity side of the equation. Um, right now and by November we will be commissioning an electrolyte facility so that's taking the final product that will come from our mining and processing asset and just taking that very last step. We have licensed a US vanadium technology that's proven and we intend to be that early mover in Australia that's going to be qualifying with the leading battery manufacturers and be first into that vertically integrated space. We also have vSun our subsidiary that has for three years been tirelessly developing opportunities with those end users 
educating them, growing. And most recently, as a simple example, we were really pleased to be awarded a contract to supply, install, and operate a battery for Horizon Power, an entity that's really excited about the technology and sees all kinds of opportunities in their grid to look for further opportunities. So that's a small but really important piece of the puzzle for us is to keep getting in front of these big energy providers and finding ways to get flow batteries uh, moving past just prototype level into the larger scale level. And there certainly are real flow batteries in Australia and other Western countries that are operating at scale profitably and achieving really good technical results. In summary, where are we at? Um, we completed the BFS, we got the grant. We are really just focused on the upcoming hurdles, which is finalizing all our permitting. So we did receive very recently a license for, to extract all our water for the uh, refinery, which is a really important milestone. And we'll continue to knock over all those dominoes in the coming months as we move towards um, final investment. Uh, all the permitting hurdles are really a key catalyst for us as, as we get there. Again, to show my appreciation, the Yagan and I have been really good in helping us work towards a cultural heritage management plan on site and also finding a way that we can commercially operate with them on their land. And we look forward to continuing to forge a path with them for a sustainable long-term relationship. Uh, we have an credi incredible team of talented people that are basically de-risking the project. So we're putting the government grant to work doing early front-end engineering and doing all the things we can now before we hit the final big green button to make sure the project is well set up for a low-risk execution. Um, in summary, investment thesis here is we have an interesting inflection point uh, comparing it to lithium seven years ago where the demand curve is really, really changing rapidly and is expected to change more rapidly in the future from a traditional commodity market to a battery metals market. Uh, in our asset, you have a 25-year low mine life asset that is scalable. We have a federal government grant and lots of other uh, government support in our sale, uh, wind in our sales to move us forward. And we are uh, intending to be, and in all likely going, going to be, the world's next primary vanadium producer because we're close to production. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to speaking with any investors who'd like to see us at our booth. Um, any questions for Graham on that? Um, Graham, I want to ask you about um, the funding. We had uh, Frank Van, Roos, uh, Van Ruin from uh, NAIF on a panel this morning, yeah. and he said there's no ceiling to government funding. Um, just wondering if you've gone back to the government to talk about the next stage of funding um, or adding to the, the current funding. Um, and also from your perspective, when you're looking at strategic funds and, uh, and regular debt and then equity components, if there's an ideal structure that you have sure. in mind when you're funding the project. Um, I'll do my best. I, I can't speak on behalf of Frank, and uh, it's interesting to hear that there's a limitless ceiling on it. But I, I have heard that from other NAIF individuals as well, so I would say that is true in a sense that there's a very buoyant optimism that there is commercial grade funding via those structures um, for projects like ours that are really, really um, at the coal face of, coal face, maybe battery face, of vertically integrating into that thematic in Australia. And in particularly in our case, I think it's easy for entities like that to get behind us, A, because we have a federal grant already. So we've done all that. We've done two years of work with the federal government to get to that point as one funding mechanism on the equity side. Um, that on a, on a debt side, these government uh, options are probably more tangible. Um, but also, the, you know, the story here is that Australians invented uh, flow batteries. We've been developing them for many decades. They're the perfect fit. And if you build these batteries with vanadium mined in Australia, concentrated here and then turned into electrolyte, which we'll be doing by November, you can actually very easily achieve batteries here that will go into the grid at like 70 or 80 percent local content. So for these large energy providers on the East Coast, there's a, this unique energy plus mining mix at a federal government level that's really integrating together. So I do think there actually is a really uh, big funding opportunity there um, on the equity side. So you asked me what the um, the ideal structure is. That's what we are really focused on making sure we get right, and it's going to be for us linked to offtake. So 
the equity and debt piece, um, as in one example, CEFC is a good opportunity for us, but their mandate will uh, be tied to batteries as opposed to steel. So if we're able to do the right offtakes that expose us to batteries, that's going to change the mix. If we, if we also do um, you know, the right uh, offtake, we may have equity through that avenue as well. So um, I don't have a clear answer for you because we're actually making sure that all the plates are spinning in the air to make sure that as a board and as a business we achieve the right um, best return to shareholders through this phase. It's nice to have options, I suppose. Yep. Um, one final question. Um, on the BFS, um, assuming that's not based on the hub concept that you talked about, um, it, can you give us an idea of how the numbers might change, broadly speaking, if that hub model were to take shape once you're in production? Um, yes, that's correct. So the BFS was based on a phase one development. Um, any future hub processing, it might take a number of commercial models. It might mean that we become a logical consolidation point as an early mover. Um, it might mean that we toll process or in the future through that um, facility near Geraldton. Um, so what do the numbers look like? I mean, we, we intend to do a study in the future on that. We haven't done the numbers, so I don't want to make any forward-looking statements. But if you took a view on vanadium price and you said that a similar uh, project to our current one could be done and that the market could absorb, say, another 4% of the market or another 6,000 MTVs, then why couldn't you conclude that the, that the NPV is multiples of our current um, NPV? Honestly, like I, that's what I spend time trying to convince investors is that there's, there's really no other easy technologies out there that can fit this long duration piece. Pumped hydro is there, right? But they're finding it's very expensive and you can't move pumped hydro dams wherever you want them to be. And flow batteries are this super robust last for 25 year plus technology that's totally proven they can just drop in in a more distributed way. Um, I, I really think the future's bright and, you know, there's not, there's South Africa and Brazil that are sort of the current logical places where you might get additional supply. South Africa actually has really good ore bodies, but they have really unique challenges as well. We have good ore bodies here and we have, um, in Western Australia, I think the most skilled people to get behind projects like this and actually build them, be successful, meet that operate, operating cost target. You know, it's one thing to have it in a, in a BFS, but as someone who's been on the pointy end of ramping up assets, it comes down to, honestly, the team. Sometimes you go to these places and people think it's about investing more capital, but it's actually getting the operating team doing the right things, and then ramp up can happen. So, and that's what, um, you know, I haven't covered fully in my presentation. Where we are differentiated, including me, is I've operated Vanadium assets, we have on our board one of the most experienced Vanadium people in the world. He's literally run the largest Vanadium companies in the world. Our COO, Todd Richardson, has spent his entire 30-odd years career running Vanadium assets like this. So we, we bring a deep understanding of how to get it right. And Todd himself has stewarded those early studies, which gives me confidence that the right things are done at that early stage that we're set up for success in the future. Thanks, Graham. Please thank Graham.